Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Paul Vanier, and uh, I would like to give a presentation entitled Traveling Standing Wave, Waves Feasibility Study. I'm with uh, TNO, which is an applied research institute, so it's very much from an application point of view. Um, so in continuous uh, flow production processes of chemicals, uh, the, the chemicals are continuously fed into pipes. And in these pipes, the chemicals react and mix. And so you have like a tubular reactor, and at the end, you get your product. For specialty chemicals, these pipes are usually very small, because the total volumes which needed to be produced are small. So typically, diameters are below one centimeter. And therefore, also the liquid, uh, and also the liquid velocity is low. So the flow is usually developed and laminar meaning that the lateral component of the flu fluid velocity vector is, uh, well, around zero. And uh, that's tricky because the mixing uh, is, in that case, only determined by the dispersion and diffusion. And therefore, the efficiency of the mixing of different constituents uh, and heat transport is limited. Now, we know from the literature that uh, you can induce acoustic streaming uh, in liquids at, let's say, medical imaging pressures. So let's say using one megapascal in the order of one mega, uh, with frequencies of one megahertz, you can get this kind of beautiful pictures. Um, so our goal is to investigate whether it's feasible to induce a uh, pressure wave field in the liquid in a pipe, which is standing over the radial axis of the pipe, but travels along the actual axis of the pipe, and as a second step, to investigate whether we can use this wave field to induce acoustic streaming and thereby increase the mixing efficiency uh, of liquids in that pipe. So I'm going to use a snapshot of one of our simulations to explain a little bit what happens in that pipe. So we have here a copper tube uh, with walls of about one millimeter thick. The inner diameter of the tube is about four millimeters. Um, liquid inside the tube is water. And um, we're exciting uh, waves using sources on the edges here. And so you can see an LO1 guided wave in the pipe here. And in front of that, just a little bit of LO2 guided wave, which goes faster. That's why it's in front. And if you condition your problem correctly, you see that the LO1 uh, guided wave refracts into the liquid to produce a standing wave field, which is radio, uh, a radially standing wave field in the liquid. And here, you can see just a little bit of LO2 wave refracting in the liquid, which does not fulfill the standing wave condition. So the concept is to, uh, again, the concept is to induce guided waves in the tube wall. They refract into the liquid creating a, radio, a radially standing uh, pressure wave field which travels along the actual axis of the pipe. So in order to do that in an efficient way, uh, you need to fulfill two conditions. The first one is the radial standing wave condition, where the angle of refraction of the guided waves uh, should be such that the standing wave criterion in the liquid is fulfilled. And the second condition is the actual condition, where the pressure wave fields, uh, suppose you have a wave traveling here, you reflect into the liquid, then there is a, a, the pressure wave field is reflected off the other side, and reflected back. It should arrive here in phase with the lamp wave traveling in the, uh, in the wall. So first, we're going to uh, I show you some results of hydrophone experiments where we investigate whether there actually is a significant radially standing wave field inside the tube. So we have a, the, the copper tube mentioned before is here. We have a, a, trans, a radially vibrating piezo on the tube, and the hydrophone is inserted from the top, and we're measuring the pressure, the, the pressure wave field in the, in the liquid. We're using 25-cycle uh, sine bursts, such that we have no overlap between the two wave modes which are present, so the LO1 and the LO2 modes. And we are interested in the LO1 mode. So when we uh, define the transfer efficiency in kilopascal per volt, defined, uh, defined as the pressure measured in the liquid, 
divided by the voltage over the transmitting piezo versus the frequency, then we see two nice standing, uh, two resonance peaks, one at 660 kilohertz, which is the seventh order standing wave, uh, and one at 770 kilohertz, which is the eighth order standing waves. And the reason why the higher ones are not present is because the transducer is just not effective or efficient uh, at higher uh, frequencies. So efficiencies are uh, in the order of 20 kilopascal per volt, meaning that we need about 50 volts to uh, get to this one megapascal value, which I mentioned before, which is quite reasonable. Uh, it's not too much. So yes, we can induce a significant standing wave field in a pipe using guided waves. So for the remainder of the, of the talk, we, uh, uh, I use the following setup. So we have the, um, the reactor, so the copper tube here, the transmitting piezo uh, here, receiving piezo on the other end just for diagnostics. Um, and we uh, evaluate the mixing efficiency by injecting a salt pulse and measuring the conduction of the salt at the inlet and at the outlet. Uh, uh, yeah, we use the pump to uh, pump degassed water past the flow sensor and then through the tube to a water reservoir on the other side. And the excitation uh, consists of sine bursts at varying frequencies and varying amplitudes. So now you see why I chose a schematic rather than a real picture of the setup, because it's uh, rather difficult to see. But our copper tube is here with the inlet conduction probe over here, the outlet conduction probe over there, transmitting piezo is here, and we have an injector on this end. So the first results the salt concentration at the inlet. So on the y-axis, uh, we display the normalized voltage, which is linear in this case uh, uh, with the salt con concentration. At the x-axis, there is the time in seconds. The black line shows the salt concentration as it was measured when there was no sound present. And the red and green lines uh, uh, show the salt concentration as it was measured when the sound was on. The dotted and uh, the dots is this uh, around the, the, the continuous curves show the standard deviations based on 10 measurements. So the first concentration is that it's really repeatable. Uh, uh, the first conclusion is that it's really repeatable. And the second conclusion we can make from this graph is that there is no significant difference when the sound is on or off. But this is the inlet. At the outlet, it's a different story. Uh, so we have you can clearly see, it's a similar graph as the one before, just the y-axis normalized to the values at the inlet, so we can compare them properly. Um, so the black curve is the curve showing uh, um, um, when the sound is off, and the green and the, the red curves show the, the concentration when the sound is on. And we can see a st uh, really a significant difference when the, when the sound is on or off. And we would expect, if the mixing is improved, that the salt concentration is actually has a lower peak. So let's zoom a little bit. This is a zoom at the start of the of the, uh, the the salt pulse at the outlet. So compared to the curve when the sound was off, the curve with the ultrasound on arrives about 1 .1 seconds later. Um, it has a peak which is low, both lower and located earlier in time. It shows a higher standard, so it shows a higher standard deviation, and apparently it has a lower surface area. Now, the, the last point was a bit surprising because that implies that the total amount of salt which passed the sensor is lower, which is strange because there wasn't a leak in our pipe. So. We think that has to do with the way how we do the conduction measurement. So we have, uh, as a conduction probe, we have two metal pins which are aligned actually inside the pipe. And the principal measurement path is between those uh, pins. So it's not across the entire volume. Our injection device is a four-way, four so-called four-way valve, where the inner diam uh, diameter of the sampling device is much smaller than the diameter of the reactor, so the copper pipe. So the salt solution is actually concentrated at the, in the injection at the center line. 
And our hypothesis is that the ultrasound induces the radial mixing. So less salt is at the center line. And therefore, the area of the concentration curve, which we measure, is lower due to, uh, 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 in the outlet. So, conclusion. It is possible to induce a significant pressure field in the liquid, which is standing across the radial axis and travels along the actual axis using guided waves. And we used LO1 guided waves in this case. Second conclusion, the salt concentration at the outlet is significantly altered by the presence of this actually traveling uh, radially standing wave field. And this suggests that we have increased convective mixing by the induced uh, radial fluid velocity components. Of course, using the concentration is an indirect measurement, but it's reasonable evidence. So in the future, we will uh, uh, focus on a new transmitter design to reduce the amplitude of the other wave modes, because then you will get a more clean standing wave pattern. And we're going to use CFD to check whether our, our hypothesis about the center lines and the explanation of the areas of the, of the curves is correct. So why, why is, it, is this why is this significant? Because it means that we can excite acoustic streaming across a really long pipe using just a few transmitters. All right, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? And I have no clue how we're doing on time. Okay, great. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question that may or may not be trivial. Uh, you showed that you have two resonant frequencies, right? Uh, one is 60, uh, 660, one is 176 kilohertz. Yep. And uh, I remember there's one graph that shows they have different uh, efficiency. One has this 20 one. kPa, yep. and the other one is 22. However, in your results, they don't show any difference. Yep. What's the reason? So in this, uh, when you look at the way how this uh, transfer function is defined, you have the efficiency of the piezos in there. So, and so I would expect a different uh, result at 660 and 770 just because of that. And there is, let's say, the, the, the resonance effect in the pipe in here. Um, so I wasn't surprised that they are slightly different. Um, and I think you don't see that much difference here because the, um, so when you look at the dotted the dots around the lines, that's the standard deviation. And so um, the, the, the lines, the green and the red lines, they don't exactly overlap. But from my point of view, I cannot make any statistically significant conclusions whether or not we get different efficiencies. So I would expect some difference. You, you're completely right in that. However, our data is not accurate enough to actually measure it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Static mixers, for example. Well, um, so when you look at uh, when you look at fine chemicals, um, usually they they have higher viscosities. Uh, and they are complicated mixes. So we have projects where the mixes con consist of thirty different ingredients, and uh, depending on what's in the flow in the pipes, they react in a different way. So uh, uh, and in practice, ne next to that. And uh, you have fouling and uh, all these other kind of things. So um, putting a static mixer inside the tube or putting stuff inside a pipe is, okay, it's what they do now, but it is because they don't have another option. Because they really would like to have a clean pipe with a, with a ideal flow velocity profile. So they can actually uh, predict and optimize the, the, uh, the way how, how their chemicals react much better. So ideally, you would like to influence the velocity field or the mixing or the reaction without poking stuff inside the pipe, so from the outside. And from a practical point of view, a lot of the chemical factories are already there. So uh, uh, when you go to a company, they will say, well, uh, yes, we would like you to improve our, our, our reaction, 
But here is the plant, and uh, by the way, because of safety reasons, we don't allow you to drill a hole inside.